topic. In fact, when we look 100 years ago, representation theory was really a heart of mathematics and basically any of the great mathematicians we know had some contributions to representation theory. It is very much the study of the groups, so maybe let me start by saying why groups are important and how were they born. And mathematics is very much about studying and recognizing symmetry, and the simplest groups come exactly from symmetry. And we can, for example, take reflections with respect to a hyperplane, and if we look what the reflection does, well, we can compose reflections, we can, if we take twice a reflection, we get back to identity, and you can see that proceeding this way, probably the axioms of the group as we know it nowadays were born. The groups that we will be interested in this lecture will be the general linear group, the group of invertible linear maps on V, the special linear group, uh, the matrices of uh, determinant one. So these are Lie groups, which, which means they have some continuous structure, and the other side of groups will be finite groups here, mostly represented by groups, uh, by the group of permutation of n elements. Throughout this lecture, I will assume that we work over uh, the complex numbers. You can, going through the, through the uh, proofs, you can realize that many of the definitions and even theorems make sense also for other fields, but some of them don't. So, so let's, let's, let's be careful about this. And uh, further, every vector space I will consider in this lecture will be finite dimensional. In particular, V will be finite dimensional. Okay. <clears throat> now, the groups GLV and SLV are not only abstract groups, they have an additional structure, namely they are algebraic varieties. And by now, this should be clear for the special linear group. So how can we realize the special linear group as an algebraic variety? Can anyone from the audience? Yes? In the determinant is polynomial? Yes, uh, exactly. One, exactly. So the, the equation is determinant equal to one, which is clearly a polynomial. If you want to realize the general linear group as an algebraic variety, you have to go back to lecture two, and there is an exercise with a hint how to do this. Now, the structure of an algebraic variety and of a group, they are not completely unrelated, as you can guess. And in fact, group operations, as inverse or multiplication, they are maps of algebraic varieties. Okay? So we will be studying such, such groups, algebraic groups, where the group operation is, is compatible with the algebraic structure, meaning that the natural maps we get from the axioms of the group are, are also maps of algebraic varieties. Okay. The most important group that we will have will be the general linear group. So let us consider any group G. And uh, this is something that if you study no matter which topic in mathematics, you realize that if you want to understand any object, it's very often helpful to look at some well-known object and try to look at all maps, either from this well-known object to the object you study, or the other way around. Try to map the object you study to this well-known object. And you can see such things in topology and so on. So we will be interested in maps from G to GLV. And the definition, a representation, Of, and here we will be studying algebraic groups. But of course you can also do it for, for any group. Is a morphism. For some vector space V.
Okay, so what does it mean? It means that every element of the group gives us a linear map, an endomorphism, an automorphism of V. Okay, and the fact that this is a group morphism gives us certain compatibilities. So this is a definition, but you can, you can also, so let's call it a morphism row. You can also see that if we have rho of G, and if we apply it to V, okay, so what, what do I mean by this? Rho of G is a map from V to V, yes? And now I can take any vector from V. So what is this? Where, where does this quantity leave? Where does it belong to? In V, yes, that's an element of V. So to shorten the notation, I will just denote it by GV. Okay, so here you don't see the representation, so somehow to use this notation, I have to assume that I think about a representation. And now the fact that this is a group morphism gives me certain compatibilities, namely, if I apply G to V, let's say G1, and then I can act with G2, Yes, this is the same as acting with G2, G1 on V. Yeah? And further, so this comes from the fact that this is a group morphism, and now because this goes to a general linear group, that is the actions are linear, we have that G lambda 1 V1 plus lambda 2 V2 is the same as lambda 1 G V1 plus lambda to GV2, yes? So our group elements act linearly on the space V, okay? And we will call, usually one refers to the map as a representation, but if the map is self-understood, we just call the vector space the representation, yes? And we say that the group acts on this vector space. So if I just give you a vector space, there is no way you can guess what kind of representation this is, but sometimes it comes with a natural structure with a group acting on it. Okay, so maybe let's start with some easy examples and let's take GL2. So our group is now GL2. Yes, and we want to represent it. So first there is a very natural representation. Can you find the vector space on which such a GL2, two by two matrices act naturally? Anyone? And yes, C square. And, and here, I mean, everyone knows the action. Yes, I take a vector and I just multiply it through, through a matrix. So this would correspond to identity. GL2 maps to the identity on, on GL2. But let's look at something more interesting, which is a second symmetric power of C2. If you don't know symmetric power, you can think about this as degree two polynomials in two variables. Yes? So just from what you just said, so GL2 maps to the identity? GL2 maps to GL2 by identity. It's clearly a map that satisfies all of the axioms you can imagine, yes? And this GL2, somehow we assume it acts on C2. So I'm, I'm just, said, so, so I asked you for a representation and everyone responded C2, but I mean, for a representation, I need a group action. So, so I'm making it extremely explicit that the group action comes from the trivial map, GL2 maps by identity to GL2. But now we turn to this more complicated space. So maybe first of all, let me ask you, what is the dimension of this space? This is a vector space. This is a question that Bernd was asking several times last week but in a more complicated way. So I'm asking how many degree two homogeneous polynomials in two variables are there? Three. Three, yes, so this is a three-dimensional space. Okay, so if I want to tell you that this is a representation, I need a map from GL2 to GL of this space, so something like GL3, okay? Which means that to a two by two matrix, I will associate a 
matrix of which size? Again, two by two. No. Three. Three, three by three. Okay. Yes. And so, so you can think about this as polynomials. So let's 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 fix a basis of C two x one x two. So what's the basis of this space of S square C square? What is the basis? A natural basis. Do you know any natural basis? If I give you a basis of C two. We need three vectors. X1 square. What else? X2 square. X2 square. And X1, X2, yes. OK? OK. So if we know how GL2 acts on X1 and X2, can you guess how it will act on G1 times G2? Oh, sorry, on X1 times X2? Is the product on G of X1? Okay, so now you may ask, how do I multiply elements of a vector space? Yes? But I do this because I'm, this is an element of S2. So this just belongs to C2, this just belongs to C2, and this just belongs to S2 of C2. Yes? OK. And now, that's an exercise for you. Write the whole 3 by 3 matrix that you get if you take here a matrix A, B, C, D. So now we will have a map GL2 mapping to GL3. Take A, B, C, D and write what is this 3 by 3 matrix. OK. And that's an example of a non-trivial representation. Now, if we... Yes. Question about the definition uh, is: Should this map, uh, the morphism, also be a, a algebraic map? So morphism. Yes. So we, in general, when you just study abstract group theory, then the answer is no. But in this lecture, the answer is yes. We will not study representations that are not maps of algebraic varieties. And is it a map of algebraic varieties if and only if each row of G is a poly is a polynomial map? Well, so you have to be careful because we didn't re pre-specify G. So what does it mean to a polynomial? But by definition, this is a map of algebraic varieties. If functions, algebra, well, algebraic, with the ring of functions of GLV, which, which we know what it is, pullbacks to functions on G. But G can be a priori any algebraic group. But yes, it, 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 in every single example we'll encounter, it means that it's given by polynomials or rational functions that are well defined. Okay. But the G might not be an algebraic variety in general. In general, it does not have to be, but in our cases, it will always be. Okay, but if it's not, then this then it doesn't make sense to say that this is a map of algebraic varieties when G is not an algebraic variety. But the definition still holds. The definition still holds, yes. So you can study representations of like huge groups that don't have an algebraic structure up here. Okay. Uh, now. Each time we introduce a new object uh, in mathematics, we often ask what are the morphisms among these objects? What are the maps? So now, and this is known as the category theory, so now the next question is how do we make a map between two representations? So we, we take a morphism between two representations, row one, of, of, of the same group, but maybe different spaces. Is such a linear map f from v1 to v2 that and I will use this shortened notation. So now we have g acting on v1 and g acting on v2 
And what could be the compatibility if we have a map between V1 and V2? Well, we would like to say that it doesn't matter whether we act on V1 and then take the F, or we act by F and then you apply the G. So it other means that it means that for all G in G and all uh, V1 in the big V1, if we act on V1, that's an element of V1, and if we take the F, this should be the same as acting on the image of V1. Okay. But even if you are seeing this for first time, you should not be afraid. It's just a usual linear map. You just require compatibility with the, with the group action. Okay. And now, let's say what's a sub-representation. Oh, that's too high for me. Let V be a representation of G, a sub-representation is a subspace. Of course, when I say subspace, I just mean a usual linear subspace, such that So what do we want from this subspace? Well, we want it also to be a representation. And what does it mean? We have to be able to act on elements from W. So it means that no matter which element from W I take, and no matter which group element I take, if I act with this group element, so first of all, does this make sense? But a priori, where does it belong? To me. To V, yes? It certainly makes sense in V. And if I want this to be a representation, where should it belong? To W. To W. Okay. So please give me some examples of representation of sub-representations. What's always a sub-representation? V. V. V is always a sub-representation, yes? Some other sub-representation, what else? Zero, zero is also a sub-representation because we, all our maps are linear, so they map zero to zero, okay? Okay, so these two always are there. And if you remember past lectures, the next step is usually to understand building blocks of our objects. If we were studying algebraic varieties, we were trying to decompose them, and we were looking at irreducible things. And we do the same with representations. We try to understand somehow smallest building blocks of representations, and for this we need a definition, a, a representation, a representation W is irreducible. if and only if zero and w are the only sub-representations. Yeah? So you should consider this definition as somehow it's the smallest. It doesn't contain a proper sub-representation. Okay? Is this definition clear? Okay, let's continue then. Uh, and now we, we go to a very, very important lemma known as Schur's lemma. We combine all of the definitions that appeared so far. So we want to look at morphisms of irreducible representations. 
So we look at any map between two irreducible representations, and we claim that this is either isomorphism, or it's simply equal to zero. Yes? That's amazing. It's for sure not true for, for many other objects that we study that, that if we take the simplest, even irreducible objects, then the maps are either isomorphisms or, or trivial. Further, yes? Uh, I have two questions. Yes. Uh, the first is, uh, first you were talking about symmetric group of an uh, object, let's say a vector space. Yes. And uh, you fixed that vector space and you wanted to see what is the symmetric group. Yes. Now, uh, in, uh, somehow in the reverse direction, you assume uh, the fixed group is given and uh, you are considering what are the spaces that this group is acting on that's exactly what we are doing yes um, what could be the connection of this two reverse approach so i i think it's, the connection is historical so first before people were coming to the definition of a group they were very much inspired by symmetry and and i think actually the precise definition of a group is is quite late because people had the confusion whether a group sh has to act on something or should it be an abstract notion if the group acts on something it somehow comes with a representation with certain symmetries but then people realized at some point that that maybe it's more beneficial to consider groups and again it's in whole mathematics once we fix an object like an algebraic variety but at some point we want to come away from the explicit description that it comes with a precise action and we want to describe it completely abstractly and for groups this is very easy we just say it's a set satisfying certain axioms we could also do the same for algebraic varieties and so on but then the question is always how is this abstract notion related to the notion we started from that is can we realize this group as symmetries of something and this is exactly how representation theory could be born Yes, so we first study symmetries of a, of, a, of a space. This leads us to an abstract definition of a group. This leads us to a question, which, how can we realize this group as symmetries of something? The, the difference that, that, that I should say is that so far I didn't assume if these groups have like a kernel or not. And I mean, you can also always take a trivial action, but this is a very general and correct setting to study how, how a group can act on a space. Yes. And the second question is this lemma gives us some kind of classification between vector spaces. Let's say representations, yes. It's, it's a first step towards understanding irreducible representations because it tells us that if we will be mapping things, well, then the irreducible things, they have to somehow map to each other. There, there will be a lemma about, about this soon. Do we know how many elements is there in the every class of uh, this classifying set? Uh, you, you, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the question. How many morphisms are there between V1 and V2? Is the classifying the, uh, the set of vector spaces. You mean uh, how many irreducible representations are there? <laughs> Ask me this question in one and a half hours. So we will exactly describe it for special groups what happens. And uh, you will know exact classification of irreducible representations for the groups I mentioned. Further, any two isomorphisms differ by a constant. So I, I mean by this that F1 is simply a multiplicity of F2, yeah? So either it's an isomorphism or it's zero, and further, if we take different isomorphism, they are basically the same up to scale. Okay, a proof. What do we know about the kernel of F? So a first question to you, what kind of mathematical object is the kernel of F? What is it? A number, an integral, 
it's a sub-representation. That's the final answer. I hoped for a vector space, but a sub-representation is even better. <laughs> So what does it mean that it's a sub-representation? Because V1 is irreducible. Either it's zero or... It's either zero or a whole space. Yes? So what happens if this is the whole space? Well, we are in this case. Morphism is zero. Yes? So this is done. So we can assume that the kernel of F is zero. Yes? Which means that F is injective. Okay, now what about the image of F? By the way, prove it, prove that this is a sub-representation if this is not clear to you. What about the image of F? What is it? Uh, Again, a sub-representation, but this time of V2. So? Uh, V2 is irreducible. Yes, because it's irreducible, either the image is everything or it's zero. But it cannot be zero because our map is injective. I mean, the only way it's zero is that we consider the map from zero to zero, which was a zero map. Okay, so it means that F is surjective. Okay, so we have a linear map that is injective and surjective. What does it mean for linear maps? It's an isomorphism. And now comes a step that, that you should also think about it at home. So this is an isomorphism of linear, linear isomorphism of vector spaces. So there exists a linear map that is an inverse. But the thing that you should also think about is that this is also a map of representations. So that the inverse as a linear map is also an inverse as a map of representations. So again, for people who know a little representation theory, it's obvious, but there is something to check here, namely that this is also not only a linear map, but that it satisfies this definition. Yes? Yes, a question? Uh, what is the connection of uh, symmetric proofs of uh, vector spaces that are representations of the same group? We, we will come back to, to, to these questions. Like, for example, on which, on which vector spaces SN can act and what are the irreducible representations, yes? That's, that's the question? Or the question is on which vector spaces SN can act? Or uh, SN can... is the only symmetric group? Well, I, I don't know what you mean by a symmetric group. But for finite groups, our main group will be the complete group of all permutations of N elements. But of course, the, well, the only one that I am able to cover in this lecture, but I mean, of course, the representations of, of finite groups, it's like a topic on its own. And actually, one of the best mathematicians in the world, Sir, wrote a book on the representations of finite groups. This is, this is something I can recommend. So I remember when I was a master's student, one of the professors said that every single mathematician in the world should have read this book. And the other professor in the audience said that, oh, I fortunately also read this book. So I really, really recommend it to you. And this is aimed at chemists. So it's not a very complicated book. That might sound offensive, but <laughs> <laughs> what, what I meant, it's not like a super abstract book and, and everyone can read it. <laughs> okay, so we finished the proof of the lemma. Yes? Is it clear? Ah, no, sorry, we haven't finished. We finished the first sentence. Now we have to take two isomorphisms and we have to prove that they differ by a scalar. Yes? So let's assume that the first one is just identity. And let's consider F2. Okay. So now we use the fact that we work over the complex numbers and we can find an eigenvector 
Yeah? So I identify V1 and V2. I already know that F1 is an isomorphism, so I can assume that F2 really goes from V to V. If you want to do it more formally, one should compose with the inverse of F1. Okay, so I have an eigenvector. <clears throat> now I look at the map that is F2 minus lambda times identity. Now, in the exercises, you will prove that you are allowed to consider such maps. I mean, of course, you are allowed to consider such maps as linear maps, but they are also represent maps of representations. So this is also a map from V to V. And V is irreducible. Does it have a kernel? Does this map, F, that I defined here, does it have a kernel? Now I made it easier for you. Yeah. Yes, why? Because uh, this uh, eigenvector is in the kernel. OK, so I have a map between two irreducible representations that has a kernel. What does it mean? It's zero by the first part. And now we finish the proof reading. OK? Questions? So what's the logic in the sense of, so you take? I take, I take two maps. And without loss of generality, I can, because two isomorphisms. And I want to prove that they are proportional. And I can assume that one of them is an identity, because it's an isomorphism. If, if you really want to do it formally, you have to compose with F1 inverse. And then F1 is really an identity of, on V1, and the other map is F2, F1 inverse. Yeah, and now we show that these are proportional. And I find an eigenvector for F2. There exists always an eigenvector. Yes, because we are over algebraically closed field. There is always a non-zero vector with this property. Always. Huh? And now I define this new map that I don't know anything about it, apart from the fact that this is a map between irreducible representations. And as observed, it has a kernel. So by the first part, this map must be constantly equal to zero for any argument. But the fact that this map is zero means exactly that F2 is lambda F1 for any, for any element of V. And that's the, the end of the proof. OK, very good. We continue. Now we go to another classical theorem known as Maschke's theorem. And uh, remember that our vector space is finite dimensional. Maybe I will stress it. And I will also assume here that the group G is finite. Uh-huh. Finite dimensional representation, of course. Everything is a, a representation. And I claim that V is a sum of VIs where VIs are irreducible representations of G. And we will prove it also. Yes. So if I have two representations, then of course I can take their direct sum. And yeah, so what's, what's non-trivial in this theorem? Just as we proved that every variety is a sum of irreducible varieties, you remember maybe, what do we have to prove here? Well, we find, uh, let's say, let's say our, our representation is not irreducible, so it means it contains a non-trivial sub-representation, and what we have to do is we have to do this decomposition. Yes? So in other words, what we really have to prove here is that, is that if W is a sub-representation 
of V, then there exists a subrepresentation uh, V prime. such that V plus V prime is V. This is non-obvious. It's non-obvious that you can find a complement to a sub-representation. I mean, you can always find a vector space that does it, but why does the action of G have to restrict? Okay, but this is completely enough if we know this, because then we proceed by induction on dimension. Yes, either V is already irreducible, or it splits into two components and each of them has smaller dimensions so we can decompose it by induction. Okay? Is it clear that this is enough to prove this? Okay, so let's, let's prove this. And now comes a very, very old and useful trick that, that uh, sometimes is referred to averaging and different kinds of this trick you can see when you will be studying representation theory all the time. Namely, how to turn something that is not a sub-representation into a sub-representation. So, as I said, it's clear that we can do it for, for vector spaces because we can take any projection, just any linear map surjective linear map. Not only surjective, but also identity on W. So we take a projection. Now, linear. Okay, so, so this W prime would be the kernel of pi. But the problem is that I cannot guarantee that this is a map of representations, yes? I can only take easily a linear map. I can only project linearly to a subspace. I haven't used the group action at all. Is it clear that this pi exists? If I have any subspace in a vector space, I can always project to it. Yes? Okay, so here comes a trick. We define a new thing that also goes from V to W, a new projection that is defined as follows. We average over the whole group. And we want to average pi. And how do we do it? Well, okay, so what does it really mean? It means that if you want to apply pi tilde to v, you have to look by the whole group, how the group element acts on V. You get a set of cardinality the order of G. Then you project every of those elements to the, uh, to the subspace W, and you act back. So in particular, if, if this was identity, so if you were on W, this is identity and these two cancel. So you just sum up the same element, the order of G times, and you divide. So in particular, this is identity of on W. But what is nice about it, that now this becomes a map of representations. It's very easy to check that it satisfies these axioms, because we are going here through the whole group. So if you act on G, V, you, you, you can act like on G and G inverse here, and you will see that you are still going through the whole group. So this is for you to check, that this is a map of representations. Okay? Yes, question. So, so on the previous point, so this existence of linear projection, does, I mean, that probably works for closed subspaces, but does it work for... I, I'm in a finite dimensional case finite dimensional, every subspace is closed and nothing, I mean, well, yeah, even, even this I think I don't need, but, but for, for finite dimensional this is obvious, yes, imagine this is like C to A and this is C to B and I just forget some coordinates. You can, you, if you want, you can always fix a basis of W, that's an independent set in V, you can extend it to a basis of V, and you just forget the coordinates that correspond to elements not in W. This is a really easy to build such a projection. 
because you can extend any linearly independent set to a basis in a vector space. The hard thing is to turn this into a map of representations. And this is done by averaging over, over the group elements. OK. And now it's basically the end of the proof if we know that this is a map of representations. Why? How do we decompose V? What's V? Don't look in the notes. What's V? Well, it's a kernel of no. yes. Exactly. So V is W plus the kernel of. And this is now a sub-representation because, as we already know, kernels of uh, morphisms of representations are, uh, are sub-representations. OK. Mateusz, one question. Why do we have to re oh, what's the reason for the restriction? We don't need a restriction. So I just wanted to say that this element is already in W, but it doesn't matter. So the image of pi is formally in W. So, so formally, this is a map on V, and formally, the image is in W. So very formally, there is this restriction. But don't worry about it. It's so do pi and pi will have the same kernel? Or? No, no, no. Pi does not have to have a kernel that is a sub-representation. It's an arbitrary subspace of complementary dimension chosen by us. And these tricks change it to a, to a subspace that becomes a sub-representation. Does it depend on pi, or is it independent? Uh, it it uh, it does depend on pi. It does depend on pi. And for example, uh, for example, we can. Okay, so that's that's a very good question that actually I want to address right now. Uh, so I said that there exists a decomposition, but I didn't say it's unique. Yes. And can you see some examples where we can see that there are, maybe I will just give it to you. Notice that every single vector space is a representation of a group where I just define GV to be equal to V. Yes? I, I don't care about G. And now, if I take any vector, so, okay. So, so if I take any vector space V, yes? How does it decompose? So what are the sub-representations? Are there any non-trivial sub-representations? Come on, anyone. That's a very easy question. Any subspace, yes? So a decomposition into irreducible is just a decomposition into one-dimensional subspaces, yes? OK, but we can see here that pi and pi tilde will agree because, because these maps are identities. So I'm just summing up pi and dividing by the order. So in particular, if you choose any subspace of V, which complement you choose depends on your choice of pi. OK, OK. And now this seems bad because we know that there exists a decomposition, but it seems that, that, that there are many and, and they are not unique. And the next theorem clarifies this, that, that really the decomposition is almost unique. So what's the problem in this example? The problem in this example is that all irreducible decompositions, uh, all irreducible sub-representations, they were isomorphic. Yes, every C1 was isomorphic. So this is a sum for I equal one to dimension of V. So we have dimension of V components and they are all isomorphic as sub-representations. And we will see that once we get rid of this, the decomposition is basically unique. So a corollary is as follows of Schur's lemma, basically. Ah, sorry, so first I need a definition. So if I take, uh, if I take uh, a decomposition of V into VIs as above, I can rewrite it as a sum, let's say, of VJ to IJ. And this is the same decomposition as this one. I just group together those irreducible sub-representations that are isomorphic. So 
what I want is that vj1 is isomorphic to vj2, even only if j1 is equal to j2. So in this example, this would be just whole, whole one c1 to the power dimension of v. Yeah, is it clear? I look at all of those irreducible representations and I group together those that are isomorphic. A definition, vj to ij is called an isotypic component And ij is called the multiplicity. Of vj. So how many times vj appears in this decomposition? Okay, so here we have just one isotypic component, the whole vector space, but the multiplicity of c1 in this isotypic component is the dimension of v. Question. Yeah, we didn't formally uh, exclude the, uh, the trivial representation as irreducible, and if you have that v zero, uh, that v j is zero, then this exponent is not well defined, right? Like. Okay, I should I should assume that v i's are non-zero. So do you usually call the trivial representation irreducible? That's that's a question. Uh, I I wouldn't. Well, that's a good question. Well, it's it's a little bit. Is one a prime number? I mean, usually you exclude it, but it doesn't really change a the theory. So so let's say that each time I will be talking about an irreducible representation, I don't mean a vector space consisting just of zero. Okay, let's continue because we are we 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 have a few important uh, things to to do. So. Here, it seems that the isotypic components and their multiplicities depend on the, on, the, on the decomposition I chose. But this is not the case. So how do we prove such a statement? We need to take two decompositions, yes? So let's say that V is a sum of Vj to Ij, and this is the same as the sum of Vk to Bk. Okay? I take two decompositions into irreducible components, and I want to say that there is a bijection that vj has to appear as one of the vk's and the multiplicities agree. That's my aim, okay? Very good. So what do we do? Well, let us consider one isotypic component here, yes? This is equality, so it means that it injects to vk BK product. Yes? Okay. Now, remember, we have a sure lemma which tells us that an irreducible representation can map to an irreducible representation only as an isomorphism or as zero. So now I can project farther to VK to BK. And I claim that if VJ is not vk, this has to be zero. Can you see this? Because every single vj here has to map somewhere here, and every single projection to vk, bk many of them, must be zero. So this is zero, is zero if k is not j. Or if, let's say, if vj 
is not VK. Is this clear? This is a corollary? No, some people say it's not clear. Is the map, how I constructed it, clear? First is an injection, because I have a space that is equal to this space, so a factor has to inject. It, this is clear. Then there is a projection, yes? And then there are projections to VKs. Yeah, because this is just, I take VK, BK many times, so I have BK many projections, yes? Okay, and I can also put VJ here. I can put it in AJ many times. But every map, no matter how I put VJ here, and no matter how I project to VK here, it has to be zero if VJ is not isomorphic to VK. But because this is for every VJ here and for every VK here, it means that this map needs to be zero. That's all right, it doesn't have to be zero if the VJ is not VK. Well, this, this one, why it has to be zero? Yes. This is Schur's lemma that we just proved. We proved that every map is an isomorphism, all zero. There are no other maps in representation theory. Morphism. Yes, so these are morphisms of representations. Every composition of morphisms of representations is a morphism of representations. Okay. Okay, so what does it mean? This is an injection that projects to zero on every k different than j. So it means that there has to exist a vk that is equal to vj. Let's call it vk zero. Because this is an injection, so it cannot be that all projections are zero, yes? So it means that there is a map, times aj, to vk zero to, to bk zero. That is an injection. Yeah, so I just look where the image of this map goes. Well, it doesn't go to the factors that don't come from Vj, so it has to go here. Yeah? And, and I have this isomorphism. Vk0 is Vj. Yeah? So what does it mean? Well, it means that Bk0 is greater or equal to Aj. Yeah? But I, I, I mean, we can also go the other way around, not starting from AJ, but starting from BK0, and we get the other inequality. So the multiplicities are well-defined of an irreducible representation. And then, because these are the spaces of the same dimension, you can see that really this is an isomorphism. So the isotypic component is mapped to an isotypic component. So this is well-defined. It's the same isotypic component. So an isotypic component, you can decompose it in many different ways. But the isotypic components themselves are well defined. So you, you want the isotypic components to be isomorphic or to be the same? I don't understand. They are the same. So this map is an isomorphism, but it's induced from this inclusion. Everything takes, space, takes place in this vector space V. So they are not only isomorphic, they are really the same subspaces in V. Okay, and this part of the lecture, we will finish with one of the most important definitions uh, in representation theory that, uh, that you also already seen uh, during these lectures, namely a character. I'm sorry, can you repeat why they are not isomorphic, but they are the same? Yes, so we have to think, what is this map? So this map is, this is a subspace of V. And this is simply V. This is equal to V. Yeah, this is a decomposition of V. So this, you think about this space as a subspace of V. And this is also a subspace of V. And the map, not any map, but the map induced by this inclusion turned out to be an isomorphism of these two spaces. So because the map induced by inclusion is the isomorphism, it means that this subspace, which sits canonically in this V, is the same as this subspace, which sits in this V. Okay? 
a very good question. I somehow wanted to sweep it under the rug, but that's important that they are the same as subspaces of V not only abstractly isomorphic. Okay, so a last definition, a character. So we take a representation. And we assume that V is finite dimensional. Uh, and a character, so we will, we will usually denote a character of a representation or, or sometimes we'll write a character of V if somehow we think about V as a, as a representation. So this is a function from G to the field that is just defined as a trace. So This is now a matrix or a map, and you take trace of it. <coughs> okay. And now I, I just wanted to finish with a few properties. If we have any decomposition into subrepresentations, not necessarily even rare, uh, irreducible, then the character of V is the sum of characters of VIs. Because trace is additive. Yes, if we have a matrix, so the fact that these are subrepresentations means that our matrix will have a block form. And this says that the trace of a big matrix is the sum of traces of the blocks. Okay. Now, if G1 and G2 are conjugate, then every character takes the same values on them. Why is this? Can anyone see? What kind of the property of trace is this? Yes? Trace Yes, exactly. So the trace of A, B, A inverse is the same as the trace of B. Mainly because trace of A, B is the same of trace of B, A. Okay. Uh, now, for those who know a tensor product, a tensor product of two representations is also a representation, and the character of the tensor product is just the product of characters as functions. Okay, and the last question for you. If I take a representation, a character, and if I evaluate it as the trivial element, what do I get? For someone who hasn't seen characters before, There is no one who hasn't seen characters before. Okay, so we have to do this. So first we have to apply the representation to the trivial element, sorry? Dimension of, Dimension of v, very good. Yes, so I was going slower because this is the identity matrix on V and the trace of an identity matrix is just the dimension. Okay. Okay, so we continue. We have characters, and to every representation we associated a character, and this is a function that is constant on conjugacy classes, and somehow preserves the decomposition, meaning that the sum of functions for the decomposition is the function for the decomposed object. And these characters turn out to tell us really a lot about the representations, and uh, let us start by, by uh, dealing with the case of finite groups. And uh, we, we introduced a product on any possible functions from G to C. We take two functions, F1, F2. And uh, we define their product as follows. <coughs> 
Okay, so this is some product, and uh, it turns out that, uh, okay, I, I, I need one more definition, namely class functions. Uh, okay, so there are a following facts that I will not prove, but you can look at them, I think, in chapter one and two of, of, of Sir's book. So it turns out that, first of all, characters, are orthogonal with respect to this product. Okay, that's already good. So it means that we have some basis of some subspace of functions. And the second fact is that characters, well, so first we can ask, what is the space of functions that the characters span? So could it be that they span all functions? Look at those facts. Could it be that any function from G to C is a linear combination? No. No, because I can't stay on conjugate classes. Very good. So, uh, so what, what really we need, we need to look at those functions that are constant at conjugacy classes. And uh, it turns out that this is the only restriction. So maybe before I state two, I will define a class function. Okay, so clearly characters are, let's work over C2. Clearly characters are class functions, yes? And clearly class functions form a vector subspace of all functions from G to C. And clearly characters are independent because they are orthogonal with respect to a product. And the other part that we are still missing is that characters really form everything. So characters span the, oh sorry, sorry, are or the characters of irreducible representations. Okay, and I should also say that here, in this part, we work with a finite group. Otherwise, the sum doesn't make much sense. Although it does, as I will make a remark in a second. Okay, and they span the class functions. Again, of irreducible representations. Okay, so now, if we want to decompose a representation, and if we want to find the multiplicities of isotopic components, what do we do? We find the character of a representation and we will be able to uniquely represent it as a sum of characters of irreducible representations. Uniquely because they are independent as functions. And there exists at least one way because there exists a decomposition. Is this strategy clear to find multiplicities? We find the character of a big representation, maybe a complicated one, and we present this character as a sum of characters of irreducible representations with coefficients. These coefficients will turn out to be non-negative integers. And these non-negative integers are the multiplicities of isotopic components. Okay? This sounds as a complicated sentence, but it's really trivial. It just follows from those easy facts. Okay. Let's work it out. Let's, let's do S3 example. Now, how many irreducible representations does S3 have? So these two facts, they will help you to answer this question. S3, the group of three. So remember, 
irreducible representations, they have characters that form a basis of class functions. So the number of irreducible representations of a finite group equals the dimension of class functions. Yes? In general, what's the dimension of class functions? That's the number of what? Class functions are just functions constant on conjugacy classes. So, yeah. Okay, so how many irreducible representations does S3 have? Are there many conjugacy classes? Three, yes? This follows from cycle presentation of any permutation. This is for Sn. Every permutation up to conjugacy has a unique representation in terms of lengths of cycles it's decomposed to. Okay, so here we have the identity. We have a cycle of length two, which is just a transposition. And we have a cycle of length three. Yes? These are all elements of S3 up to conjugation. Okay, and now we need to cook up three representations. We know there are three from, from this. Can anyone give me an irreducible representation of S3? One is very easy. There is always one very easy irreducible representation of any group. The trivial one, yes? You can act on one dimensional vector space by not acting on it, by identity, yes? Okay. Okay, so trivial representation. Okay, so identity, uh, transposition, and cycle, they all map to the, same, to the same map that is just the identity of a one-dimensional space. And the identity of a one-dimensional space has trace one. So we get a one, one, one. Okay? Is it clear? Wait, the class, the, 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 that's a character, or what is it? Yes, so now I'm taking, so, so I take the trivial representation, so there has to be an associated character, and I'm acting, I'm, I'm putting here the value of this character on this element. So what's the value of a character on an element? Well, I have to see what is this element as a map. But because my representation is trivial, every element gives me the same map, the identity map of a one-dimensional space. Why is the space one-dimensional? Because if it's two-dimensional, it's not irreducible. Also, if it's three or higher dimensional, it's not irreducible, but okay. Yes? Okay, now there are two more irreducible representations. One is still very easy, and you know it. Signed representation. So this is still one dimensional representation, and we act on a vector by a sign of a permutation. Yes? So what's the sign of this permutation? Yeah. Well, that's one. Ah, okay, I switched. Okay, what's the sign of this permutation? Okay, what's the sign of this one? Yeah. Okay, now let me give you a fact. Uh, sum of squares of dimensions of irreducible representations is the order of the group. So, sorry, uh, the sign, uh, this will still go into a one-dimensional? Yes. And you can see it through this one, for example. Because the value of the character on the identity is the dimension of a representation. Yeah, that's why I asked. And again, uh, dimension one is necessary in order to have it be reducible? Yes. I mean, you can take a sum of two sign representations, and it is a representation, but it's not an indecomposable representation. 
Okay, so either from this theorem, or if you cook up this orthogonality and so on, you can see that there is one more representation, and it's two-dimensional. And you can cook up the whole table. I will give it to you. So what is this representation? Does anyone know this representation, the two-dimensional irreducible representation of S3? So there is a natural three-dimensional representation of S3. Just label the elements one, two, three, and act on the basis by permutation. Yes? This is not an irreducible representation because the sum of the basis elements, yeah, so let's take E1 plus E2 plus E3, if we act no matter with which permutation, this vector is preserved. Yeah? So this three-dimensional permutation has a one-dimensional irreducible sub-representation. And this is the complement. This is a two-dimensional representation that is a complement, and it can be regarded as symmetries of a triangle. Two-dimensional symmetries of the triangle. But I, I prefer to think about it as the three-dimensional thing modulo the one-dimensional vector, with, which is this one. And if you don't want to do this, by an explicit construction, you can cook up these numbers from the orthogonality. So check that this is orthogonal. So no, note that it seems it's not orthogonal. I mean, one uh, minus one, one, that's not zero. So did I make a mistake? What's going on? Notice that we are- You have, uh, you have to count how many elements. Exactly. Exactly. So here, we don't go through representants of conjugacy classes, but we go through group elements. And then you will see that this works out. Uh, by the way, uh, it will not work out because this is a zero and this is a minus one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so sorry, what is the... Yes? Um, what is the second or two-dimensional representation? So did we figure that out now? Or yeah, so, so I told you that there is a three-dimensional representation. Is that one clear? I label the basis vectors with elements one, two, three, and the S3 acts by permuting those. So the identity just keeps them, but the one, two transposition keeps E3 fixed, but exchanges E1 and E2. And this is a representation, a three-dimensional representation that is reducible. It's a sum of two representations. And one of them is very easy. If I take E1 plus E2 plus E3, this is preserved by any permutation. Yeah? If I change E1 and E2, I get E2 plus E1 plus E3, but it's clearly the same. So if I decompose this three-dimensional representation, I get a one-dimensional representation and a two-dimensional representation that can be regarded as symmetries of the triangle in a plane. Are we sure that's reducible then? You should prove it. You should prove it, yes. But if it's reducible, it would have to decompose into this and this, because these are the only one-dimensional representations. So you have to prove that there is no vector that is preserved by everything or that changes a sign. And that's quite easy to, to prove it. Exercise, do it. I'm not saying it's like completely trivial. If you are seeing it for the first time, you probably don't see this representation, but it's really important to understand it. Okay, so this was for finite groups. And it turns out that much of the theory goes on to not only finite groups, and in particular, we will, we will focus on GLN and SLN. Um, for them, again, the theory of decomposing into irreducible representation holds. I will not present it here, but the analog of Mashka's theorem that a representation decomposes into irreducible factors holds. And we call such group groups reductive. So you can think that reductive means that a finite dimensional representation reduces into irreducible components. Okay. Now, we would like to do the same. 
we would like to understand the, the uh, theory of representations of GLN and SLN through characters. But the problem is that right now, we cannot, we cannot uh, draw a character table for, for many reasons. I mean, on what would we evaluate our, our characters? I mean, it's not that we can just find a finite number of elements. So we need to replace this finite number of elements. Yes? So let's take a representation. Let, let W be, be a representation of GLN, okay? And we, so, so we have a map, GLN to GLV. And we would, we have the associated character. And before, I told you that it's enough to, to understand it on conjugacy representatives. So what could be here the analogs? If I take a random matrix, what is it conjugate to? Take a random matrix, how over C, it's conjugate to what? The form? Yes, but if it's a general matrix, then the to the diagonal matrix. So a good representative could be diagonal matrices. So we take a T diagonal matrices. Now, in principle, the character goes from the whole group to C. But what happens if we know its restriction to T? Is it enough to determine the whole character if we just know how it acts on the diagonal matrices? So first of all, if we know this restriction, we also know how the character acts on diagonalizable. Yes? That's clear. But diagonalizable, they are dense in the set of all matrices. And our characters, everything is continuous. Trace is continuous. Our functions are continuous. So if we know it on a dense set, we also know it everywhere. OK, so the conclusion of this is that if we know if we know the restriction of the character to T, then we know the character itself. Is it fine? OK. Now, so think about this T as good representatives on what we want to understand the character. OK? OK, so T is a subgroup of GLN, so GLV is also a representation of T. Yes? And we want to understand now this representation and its character. OK? So what does it mean? We have an action of a torus of diagonal matrices. I should say diagonal, non-degenerate, of course. Non-degenerate matrices, and we want to understand what is the trace, yes? Is it, is it clear? I act with T1 up to Tn on some element V, well, or, or this acts on the vector space V, and I want to understand the trace of this action. Okay, and now we check if you understood very well the lecture about toric varieties. What happens when the torus acts on a vector space? Or more generally, if an abelian group acts on a vector space? Can anyone see how an abelian group, if it acts on a vector space, what are the irreducible representations for an abelian group? What are the representations of a torus? How can a torus act on a finite dimensional vector space? OK, so this is what I sometimes call the most important theorem in mathematics. So every, every irreducible representation of 
a torus is one dimensional. Prove it, it's easy. That's one of the exercises. Okay, so what does it mean? What does it mean in terms of how this T acts on V? It means that as a representation of T, V decomposes into VIs that are one dimensional. Or if you prefer, you can put together isotopic components, but the representation is one dimensional. Do you remember characters that were introduced in the lecture about toric varieties? So a torus had characters. Yes? And the characters you find there were exactly the Laurent polynomials. Very good. Is it clear that the definition of characters there um, yeah, corresponds coincides with our definition in the... That's a very good question, and that's exercise one in today's lecture. So let's say we have a Laurent monomial. How do we cook up a one-dimensional representation from it? How does C T act on C1? So at least one way. If I have a Laurent monomial, how can I define a TV? I take the monomial on T, and this is how I scale V. Okay? And that's a representation. That's a one-dimensional irreducible representation. And what is the Laurent monomial? Sorry? What, what, what is the Laurent monomial? I fix a Laurent monomial. Yes. And I tell you how to build a one-dimensional representation of a torus from it. I have to define how a T acts on V. So I'm defining this dot. And I define it as a number times V. It's just scaling. OK. So the thing is that this is the same. And this you have to prove. That irreducible representations are one dimensional. And one dimensional representations, they correspond to characters. And the name character is the same because the trace of a one dimensional thing, well, a trace of a one by one matrix is just the entry of that matrix. Very good. OK, so we started from a representation of GLN. And we cooked up a representation of the torus, which gives us Laurent monomials with some multiplicities. And now you are lost. So let's do some examples. I will just write this, what, what it really means, that this V decomposes over the Laurent monomials. And now we have the subspace corresponding to this Laurent monomial. So by this, I mean the, the C1 I would denote by 6 chi, the representation corresponding to a character, to some power AB. OK. So we have plenty of examples in the notes. Let's start with, with, with the example we already seen before. So we had x1 square, x1, x2, x2 square. Yes? How do diagonal matrices act on this? T1, T2. OK, so in this three-dimensional space, can you find vectors that are just rescaled when I act with a diagonal matrix? OK, so how does this act on x1 square? We started today from this. It acts on x1. How does this matrix act on x1? Come on, that's easy. How does a diagonal matrix act on x1? T1 times X1. T1 times X1. 
Uh, so you remember, this is how we defined the action on this. And this is just t1 square x1 square. Yes? So this vector is rescaled. Yes? And the corresponding Laurent monomial is just t1 square. Okay, now the same with x1, x2. You will get the t1, t2, x1, x2. And x2 squared is t2 squared, x2 squared. Yes? That's obvious. No, a question. I mean, so, so what does this notation mean? So you have a matrix times... A so variable. in the morning we said that any matrix, non-degenerate matrix, has to act on this three-dimensional space. And we did it by checking how it acts on every single vector. And now I restrict from this arbitrary two by two matrices to diagonal matrices. And, yes? So how can a two dimensional matrix act on a three dimensional space? Yes. So. That was in the morning lecture. There was an S2, this was S2C2. And we decided that there are three, this is a three dimensional space on which GL2 acts. Acts on it. Yeah, it just sends A, B, C, D, X1 square to like, well, you have to see how it acts on X1. So it's like AX1 plus CX2 times AX1 plus CX2. Okay? But it turns out that these three special vectors in this space, they are invariant with respect to the torus action. So it turns out that this three-dimensional space is really a sum of three one-dimensional spaces, all of them with multiplicity one, Yes, so here, this sum, we will, it, will, it will be a sum for b equal two zero. There will be one for b equal one one, and there will be one for b equal zero two. Yes, and here we have v two zero plus v one one plus v zero two. Yeah? Each of them is a one-dimensional vector space that is a representation of a torus on which a torus acts with a corresponding character. So in this space, the generator is x1 square, and the torus acts just by rescaling. Are you with me or are you lost? Okay, so the first problem, what is S2 of C2? S2 of C2. That's the second symmetric power of C2. If you don't know symmetric power, think about this as degree two polynomials in two variables. That's a two degree two homogeneous polynomials in two variables. That's a three dimensional space on which GL2 acts. It acts very naturally because you just know how to act on X1. So you act on a product just by acting on every linear factor. And from what I said before, we don't look at the action of the whole G2, we restrict to diagonal matrices. We see how diagonal matrices act on vectors, and the theory tells us that there are vectors that will be just scaled. They will not go to a sum. So for example, if you take x1 square plus x1, x2, this is not just scaled by the torus. It's not scaled. But these are the eigenvectors for the whole torus. And you will always find them. They will always give you a basis of your space. Yeah, and this is the decomposition. So, so, so we started from a representation of the whole zero. Yes. And then we look, we restrict it to uh, diagonal matrices. Yes, and this gives you a representation of the torus. Yes. Which gives you a Laurent polynomial. A bunch of Laurent monomials. And they could be with some multiplicities. So here it happened that there is only one vector that gets a t1 square. But a priori there could be two. So for example, if we would take a sum of two such spaces, but here we take a new one. Yeah? And we, we say that the action is just the same. So y1. I mean, the group just are on x1 just as it acts on y1. So then this space corresponding to t1 square would be two-dimensional. It would be a space spent by y1 square and x1 square. Don't, don't you, didn't you say that 
they are one dimensional or irreducible representation. So this is a sum of two, so this, this two dimensional representation is reducible. It is a sum of this representation and this representation. And because they are isomorphic, you can also say that this is a sum that the generators are like this. You don't have a distinguished decomposition. So it depends on the, how many, how many representations are you looking at? I fixed, so, so, okay, let's go back to this one. I fix one representation okay. of GL2, yes. yes? And this happens to be also a representation of a torus. One representation of a torus. But as a torus, it's not an irreducible representation. It's reducible. Because every representation of a torus that is of dimension higher than one is reducible. So we can decompose it as a representation of the torus. So it is a sum of irreducible representations of a torus. And we want to understand those one dimensional irreducible representations of the torus such that this is a sum of them. And in this example, we have three such one-dimensional irreducible representations of a torus that sum up to this three-dimensional representation. So in order to determine what are the one-dimensional ones, you look at what eigenvectors? Yes. So here I was lucky, because the basis you provided me happened to be eigenvectors. I took x1 square, and it was just scaled when I applied the torus action. If you gave me a different basis, like x1 square plus x1, x2, let's do it. What will happen if I act on a torus with, with, with the element x1 square plus x1, x2? Yeah? So what happens when I act with t1, t2 on x1 square plus x1, x2? Well, I get t1 square x1 square plus t1, t2 x1, x2. This is not a scalar multiple of this vector, which means that this vector is not an eigenvector. It doesn't define a one-dimensional representation of a torus. But these three vectors, they define one-dimensional representations of a torus. Yes? What can I extend representations of the torus representations that you know um, yes, that's, that's another good question. So there is a whole theory. So, so let, let me tell you what are weights, and then I will briefly answer this, but I will just, just touch it. So, uh, okay, so a definition. Okay, so, so we, we use this notation. We decompose V as representations of a torus, yeah? And we, we assume that here all a, b's are non-zero, because, I mean, if it's zero, we can take all b's. Okay. So, so I use this notation. And b, that's a character such that a, b is non-zero, is called a weight. Okay, so now a question for you if you understand this definition. What are the weights of this representation? How many there are and what they are? One. One weight. So there is only one V something that is non-zero? Three weights, very good. And what are they? Yes, two, zero, one, one, zero, two. Okay? Uh, can you repeat the definition of a weight then? A weight is this vector in Zn, in this sum. These are those characters that really appear in the representation of a torus. Yeah? So here, 2, 0 did really appear. It appeared at t1 square. 1, 1 did appear, t1, t2. T2 squared did appear because of x2 squared. But for example, 3, 0 didn't appear because there is no vector that with the action of a torus, it's mapped to T1 to the third times this vector. There is no such vector. So I don't understand what the two coordinates. Um... 2, 0, this is the notation from the lecture of toric varieties. It means that this is T1 squared T2, 0. 
This is the exponent. This is how we go from a character to a lattice element. The exponent that gives the eigenvalue. The exponent of the Laurent polynomial. OK. Now, I will, I will just maybe during the exercise briefly touch what, what one can say when you are given weights, does it come from a representation or not? But, uh, but I will not be able to do it during the, the lecture. So, so weights are characters, is that right? Weights are characters that appear in a representation. Okay, okay but a weight is, is an element of the set of characters. Yes. Or just a point of Zn, because characters of a torus are just lattice points in Zn. So a weight is just an n tuple of integers. OK? Or is it very confusing? So a few people before the lecture asked me about this part, and it seemed that a lot of people got lost here. Is it clear what's a character and what's a weight of a representation of GLn? When did you switch back to GL? You're still talking about Torah. I started from GL. I start from a representation of GL. Then I restrict to a torus. And these are weights, those that come from the torus, for a representation of GL. So I start with a representation of GL. And I call weights those elements that really appear in the decomposition as a torus. But then make a step back. No, no, and we will basically almost not be making a step back. Uh, OK. OK. So now I introduce an order on weight. Lexicographic order. So I first compare the first coordinate, if they are equal, then the second one, and so on. OK, let's go back to this example. What is the highest weight here? There are three weights. Which one is the highest? The first one. OK. And this is very important, highest weights. Uh, so, so let me write a proposition that I will not prove. Every irreducible representation. OK, now I can do the same if I replace GL by SL. And here I take the torus, but the last entry is specified by the first n minus 1 entries, because the product has to be equal to 1. So it's really a torus of one smaller dimension. So really, the weights will now not be in Zn, but it will be in Zn minus 1. But the whole story goes the same. I just look at, at those diagonal matrices such that the product of the diagonals is equal to 1. OK. So every irreducible representation of SLn is determined by its highest weight now we have a highest weight and the corresponding space so if we have if we have xi in zn or zn minus 1 highest weight then the corresponding isotypic component is called the highest weight space. Okay, so let's just check if we are on the same page. What's the highest weight space? What's the highest weight space here in this decomposition? V to 0. What's the dimension of the highest weight space? Yeah. 1. OK. By its highest weight, and, uh, and, uh, and the highest weight space is one-dimensional. 
highest weight space is one dimensional. So instead of talking about S2 of C2, I could just give you two zero. This highest weight determines the representation. There is no other irreducible representation with this highest weight. Okay. So, but can, can we re can we recover the other components? Just given yes. Is this like also different? yes? It's combinatorial. It's explicit, and it will not be done here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And further, we can characterize weights. A weight is highest. for some irreducible representation. A weight, let's say A1 up to An minus one, even only if A1 is greater or equal than A2 is greater or equal is greater or equal than An minus one is greater or equal than zero. Okay, so two is greater or equal than zero. Yeah, the proposition holds. Okay, but for example, one one should also be a highest weight of something. Huh? And you should be able to find a representation for which one one is a highest weight. Ah, by the way, this is one dimensional. And the vector that belongs here is called the highest weight vector. <laughs> Such sequences of integers that are not increasing, they can be encoded in a very nice combinatorial way by Young diagrams. So a Young diagram, diagram, encodes A1 greater or equal, greater or equal than An minus one, greater or equal to zero. And how do we do it? We draw boxes. A1 many of them. We draw boxes. A2 many of them, and so on. And we draw boxes An minus one many of them. I, do, I don't have time to provide a formal definition, but I mean everything that can be obtained like this is a Young diagram. This is a definition of a Young diagram. So boxes, one on top of each other, and every next row can be at most as long as the previous one. So what's, what's the Young diagram here for this representation, S2 of C2? What's the Young diagram? Sorry? For the irreducible one, two, zero. Yes, it's an irreducible representation, two, zero. So how it would look like? It looks like this. Yes, that's the Young diagram. So instead of writing S2, I can just write two boxes. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> Now, what about characters? How are the characters related to this story? Well, if we have this decomposition, so remember that we want to see how the character acts when restricted to a torus. How can we say this in terms of this decomposition? So what is this function? When we look at the torus, if we know the decomposition. What is this character? How do the diagonal matrices act on this space and what is the trace? Okay, so focus. This is very easy, but just focus for five minutes. B, that's a B, that was supposed to be a B. <laughs> yes, so, so let's, let's fix a good basis. Let's fix a basis that 
preserves this decomposition. So a trace doesn't depend on which basis I choose. Okay. So I have some vectors in VBs. So let's call them like XBs. And, and I have XB1s, XB2s. Yeah? So these I have AB1 many. These I have AB2 many. Yes? I just pick a vector in every VB. Yeah? Okay. And the same here. Now, how does the torus act on XB1? If I pick an element of a torus, how does it act on XB1 where XB1 was taken from VB1? What is this? Scaling. It's scaling by what? By basically B1. So let's write it character of B1 on T. Yeah? That's, that's the definition because these are one dimensional representations. So what do we have? Xi B1 of T. Xi B1 of T. Xi B2 of T. And so on. Yeah? So what is this character? Well, it's Xi B1 of T. How many times? A B1 times. And now, this happens for every isotypic component. Yes, is this clear? The character is just the monomial corresponding to a weight space with a coefficient corresponding to its multiplicity. That's for irreducible and only if the dimension is one. No, that's not only for irreducible. This works for, this works, we, we make no assumptions on V, but no matter what V is, this become one dimensional because the torus has only one dimensional irreducible representation because of the most important theorem in mathematics. <laughs> okay. Okay, so what's the character here? Come on. <laughs> on the torus. Sum of monomials. Sum of monomials. Which monomials? So is the T1 square. Okay, someone started saying it. Yes, it's just this. Okay, now there is a general formula and definition for characters that, uh, that come from irreducible representations, and these are known as sure polynomials. If I take an irreducible re decomposition, let the V be an irreducible decomposition, uh, representation, representation of GLN uh, given by, given by Young diagram lambda. Lambda meaning lambda one greater or equal, greater or equal than lambda n then the character of this representation, this is known as the Schur polynomial. This is the determinant of a matrix that just takes at the ijth entry ti to lambda j plus n minus j. Now, this matrix vanishes when Ti is equal to Tj, because the rows become the same. So it's divisible by the Vandermond. So this is an honest polynomial. Okay, I just have one minute and I have three important topics. <laughs> so, first of all, compute characters. Try to do it, for example, for, for that one. 
try to understand those Schur polynomials. And now the analog of the previous statement holds. The Schur polynomials, they form, they are symmetric polynomials, and they form a basis. So now if someone gives you a representation, you can find the decomposition by looking at the character of this representation and expressing them in terms of Schur polynomials with different lambdas and different coefficients. And the coefficients will give you the multiplicities of the corresponding isotopic components, just as it was for finite groups. Okay, and it seems I have to finish, but there is an important topic of Schur-Weil duality that is very beautiful, and I strongly encourage you to read it at home. Thank you.